Welcome to the Meltdown Podcast from June 22nd. I had to look that up. <laughs> and we're not in the usual studio. We are at Prusha's headquarter studio. And today with me. Oh, it's me, Joel Telling, otherwise known as 3D Printing Nerd. And I'm Joe, otherwise known as The Noob. Yeah, or The Mistake. <laughs> or The Mistake. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so wh wh why are we here today? Why have we gathered today in this special occasion? <laughs> uh, well, obviously, I mean, we're all here because it is Prague Maker Fair. Yeah, it is the, the, the second year, you know. It's, it's a small maker fair, and it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of special. We are going to talk about that. Um, but let's go through the topics today that we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, in the news section, Maker Media ceases operation, um, the company behind Make Magazine and the Maker Fairs, and we're going to discuss what that means for all the, well, all the products and brands that they've put out over the years. Um, ACR 10 has caught fire. Okay. Surprise. It's, that yeah. is surprising. It's surprising. Yeah. It's surprising. Cheap, like a cheap printer? Well, <laughs> yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the quick story, Felan Feli on Twitter is, is stealing photos from Neris, right? To and others. And Oh, and others as well. To promote a scam or to promote some printer. But as soon as you're stealing photos, you, you, you're basically a scam, right? Yeah. Um, and in like the, the big topic that we probably going to talk about anyways is like what is the future of 3d printing and how can we make them more efficient we're going to see where we end up on that scale whether it's going to be you know all about making them more efficient or just generally we'll see we'll see we'll see all right but yeah make a fair this make a fair is it's actually pretty nice I'm liking it. This is a wonderful Maker Faire. I like the smallness of it. And I think someone someone said it was like the best parts of Murph and the best parts of a Maker Faire kind of put together. A lot, yeah. a lot of really openness and passion and and a lot of a lot of kids showcasing really cool stuff. Yeah. I think the one thing that I like the most is that it, it, you're not going into a place where people are trying to sell you something. They actually want you to sit down in every booth and do something, make something with them, blow glass or, or paint <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah, as or, you have done. Which yeah. I did, and it worked. Let's see, where is it? Is it in my pocket? I'm going to have to. Yeah, Joe. Uh, Joe oh, it's over there. It's over there. Here. But, uh, oh, wait, no, it's in my pocket. It is in your pocket. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> I made that. I made this at Maker Fair. Yeah. I learned how to blow the glass, the proper way to do it, and how you have to keep turning it. And then the guy showed me that it was tough and it was solid. And yeah. he then uh, softened the edges and allowed me so to make a little whistle. Cut your lips open. So that's I, good. Yeah. So I didn't bleed all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that that's really great about this particular Make a Fair is that it's it's really hands on. There's there's so many kids out there. Yeah. Like, I don't think I don't think I've, I've seen a Make a Fair that has that good of a ratio of kids to adults. Tons. I mean, and, yeah. and we're talking about also including the, the like New York and the Bay Area Maker Fairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, those are the Maker Fairs, essentially, yeah. right? But if you go yeah. to other mini Maker Fairs, uh, specifically, I want to talk about the Portland Mini Maker Fair. There is a large kid representation there right. as well. So maybe it's the smaller, more community-driven Maker Fairs that actually allow for the kids to come and feel welcome. Yeah. And it's it's great that like they can go into the booths and learn so soldering or just basic woodworking or blowing glass uh, yeah. or they had a, a big was it ugu no the the, the cornstarch and water pool outside yeah oh. ublek ublek right ublek of yeah. my daughter was here she, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh and then there was this there was a slime station so the things that we do at home. 80% of the things I do with my, my daughter at home is how to make homemade slime. Like, it's slime everywhere. And, it's, it's, it's still, yeah, but, and I sent a photo to my wife. I'm like, we need to bring Katie here next year. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. But my sister loves that slime stuff, too. And yeah. I, I just think it's gross. Like, why would you do? Yes, why? But, why? It was a, I, uh, my daughter used to make it because it was popular in school at the time. And then it's no longer popular in school. Yeah. So, so it's, it's the 2019 fidget spinner. I have a very large bag really of uh, foam balls for like um, yeah, the melting, seating yeah, cushions yeah, yeah. and stuff that would melt into yeah, it. Yeah. Now I just have to find a place yeah. for it. <laughs> right. So that's Maker Faire. And, and this Maker Faire was happening right after Maker Media announced that they were shutting down. So you you have background in that? No. Uh, I don't have back. I, I knew... I mean, every when I was at Bay Area Maker Fair, this there year. was there was talk about it before right. that, where everybody was like, "This could be the last, the last one. one. This could yeah. be the last one." Everybody kind of had that on their mind, like it could be the last yeah, one. Yeah, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't because Maker Media kind of was struggling. It was like 
the maker fair itself was struggling because it was getting so expensive and oh. so huge and such a mess to, to, to deal with. I know from last year where I've been, it's just, it's this massive operation. And you're almost, you're almost shutting the city down, for the, at least that area in San Francisco. Sure. It's, it's craziness. And I, I, I don't think that could have been sustainable either way. But I, I, well, I kind of agree with you because it was such a large operation and they had to keep, or at least from what I've, I can tell, they had to increase prices for booths for companies that wanted yeah. to show. But also ticket prices for like a three-day ticket was over $100 US. Yeah. And if like for I'm one my, person for one person, one so person, if yeah. myself, my wife, and my three kids went, that's over five hundred dollars that we would be spending you for a three go, days there. I don't know how expensive Disneyland is, but you could almost have gone there yeah. instead. It's not that far off, yeah. not that far off, depending on you know how often <clears throat> you go. Uh, and it's to me, it's kind of interesting because Maker Fair catered toward the Maker Movement, and the Maker Movement is correct me if I'm wrong, about repurposing, recycling, exactly. and and reusing. And if, if, if you're trying to cater to the demographic that is repurposing, recycling, and reusing, those are generally people that don't go out and buy a lot of really yeah, new, exactly. expensive stuff. And, and those are the people that might not want to spend $500 for That's a couple right. of days to look at recycled stuff. <laughs> so then if those are the people that are, that, that are the demographic, then how do you attract the companies that can afford to pay... Yep the money to put the booths there. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I, I know that companies have been struggling to pay for that as well because, as you said, it's, it's been getting expensive, really expensive for companies to even have, like, the, the small, what is it, you know, 20-square-foot booths, essentially. Yeah. Well, I think, I know... Yeah. Um, it used to be Ultimaker had a booth, Lulzbop had a booth, Matter Hackers yeah. had a booth, and I think the year after that, Matter Hackers and Ultimaker were sharing a booth. Or yeah. were, you know, or yeah. like Ultimaker and Lulzbot yeah. was in the Matter Hackers yeah. booth. Yeah. And it was, it was a way of, of combining so they didn't have to spend so much money on a booth. And I, I can't blame them for that, right? If, yeah. if, if they want to showcase to these potential people, but they don't. But that's a lot of money to set up for a booth. Yeah. And did you see yesterday they officially said New York Maker Fair is not happening this year? Oh, mm-hmm. well. There's one smiling and one crying eye on this. Uh, it's like, as, as you said, the maker fairs have been becoming this monstrosity. Um, but also, it's 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 kind of this beacon on the horizon where it's like, oh yeah, this is this is where all the makers go once a year to meet. Yeah. It's like yeah. one one for the west coast, one for the east coast, and you just get together. But you know, as we've seen with this prog maker fair, like smaller maker fairs are, you know, have their own charm yeah. as well. Oh, they do. But do you think there's still a market for a larger fair? Do you think that restructured a bit, a company or a collaboration of companies could come in and put on a larger event that would cater to makers? Do you think that's possible? It's just tough because the logistics behind that is just so much more. And and also for for people to travel there. Um, Like you're saying, Portland Maker Fair for you, that's right around the corner. Right. Um, this make a fair, yeah, it's a it's a three three hour drive for me. For you, it's it's a short flight, yeah. yeah but you know, in the U.S., you, you, there's probably more of a of a spatial um, separation between yes. where where people actually live. So just having one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and then of course pe- people from all over the, the world flying there may just be too big. Yeah, um, maybe that's not. I, I I think I already posted this on Twitter. Like maybe make affairs are not these big maker fairs, maybe that's not what a maker fair is yeah. supposed to be. And maybe, I, I don't know how it all works, but I don't see why make should spend the money to make maker fairs or, or sh- do they need to spend the money to make the maker fairs? Maybe if you do it on a smaller scale, you can get, you know, um, like like the Prague one. It's Prusa and a couple of other sponsors and they pay the licensing to use the make name and ultimately make would just be making money out of that. Mm -hmm. licensing they wouldn't actually be dishing anything out true so that would involve a couple companies yes you know coming in but at least you put it on a smaller scale where it's more attractive even i see what you're saying well there's also the murph model which is i mean i I know cmi cnc is a sponsor but the sponsorships are really low it's it's a very targeted convention but it's i mean we were all three of us were there this yeah. year, and to say that it was packed is is yeah, doing a disservice to the word. So we, yeah. we have the demographic and we have their attention, and in the middle of nowhere in the U.S. Yeah. and, and it's still, twenty countries yeah. are still represented. Yeah. So I think there's something there. I think between the small maker fairs and I think between 
the World Maker Fair or the Bay Area Maker Fair, I think there is something that could be structured with enough community support and enough corporate support that could be targeted to the right demographic and at the same time uh, uh, appeal to those who don't have the means to yeah. go to a larger yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, I mean, one good thing that we, that we have with these larger fairs and these cross well, cross uh, discipline ones is that you just get to see so many things that you don't yeah. usually get to see. Yeah. Like we are in very deep in the 3D printing end, but <laughs> right. how many 3D printing companies were there today at Prague Maker Fair? Two or three? Just, yes, yeah. about two or three. Literally Handful. two or three. Pusha obviously being the big sponsor, yeah. they're, sure. they're putting on the show, they're making this happen, but people are using 3D printing, but people are also doing so much else that is yeah. not 3D printing. And I think that's really worth something that we get to get out of out of that headspace. Okay, every tool is a hammer. No, that's that's Adam Savage's book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's what's the name? Uh, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that thing. So, yeah, at at a, at a smaller scale. Yeah. Like the small make affairs. We we also have the the Make Munich, which is not a make affair because they don't have the official license, but it's still the same idea. Um, so you get to see things. That's. I think that, that that's good as well. Yeah, in Malta, we yeah. have the um, the National Robotics Fair, which does involve a little bit of 3D printing, but it's mostly like very similar to this. You know, you have hobbyists who want to showcase what they do. And like going into that is like five euros for us, you know? Yeah. Uh, that sounds and great. And it's, it's brilliant. You know, we have this huge space. We have a lot of people this year. It was actually much bigger than last year. Um, oh, we're only two 3D printing companies showcased there. Everyone else was just showcasing what they do you have a couple of, of um, companies showcasing their products as well you know those would be the bigger sponsors mm -hmm. of it a government gets involved as well in that promoting it and subsidizing parts of it so the University of Malta also takes part so wow that's, and hopefully hopefully uh, by next year we'll make a maker fair out of it mm. like the Malta maker fair so Open them I'll up. I'll go if you go. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's not that far. For you, <laughs> I can probably cycle to Malta. <laughs> uh, <that's> <laughs> far out. It would take me a month, but yeah, doable. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing that that's attached to Maker Media is the Make Magazine. Right. Um, it's not just Make Affairs. It's the same company putting also putting out the, the Make Magazine, and that's I guess not going to be happening anymore. I or in new oh. hands or something like that i don't know so i don't do, 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 do you actually read make magazine I, I i don't i have no copies of it and i don't read print media so i yeah, have a subscription. <laughs> i have a subscription to it oh i've opened it once and to be honest i i just received i think it was about a week ago i received the last edition and i recognize the the letter it comes in and i didn't even open i want to keep it like sort of a memento Ooh, yeah. like like that's going to stay there wow so, i don't think i've read i think i've read a few articles from the first magazine which i received like a year ago um, but i've never read any other one and i think it's more of a um, laziness kind of thing to cancel the subscription to be completely honest <laughs> well uh, you know what's interesting so about print media i mean we have digital media not just not just like you know twitter and blog posts yeah. but we have YouTube videos. Yeah, we 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 happen yeah, to make some right. here, and is that more of a draw than print media? Is is that why Make Magazine? Is that why part of why Make failed is because free how to and DIY content was available in video form? Possibly. I mean, Hackaday's is not part of Make Media, right? Right. But they're basically the the, the online version of Make Magazine, I guess, for many people. Okay. Yeah. At least for, for, to me, that feels like it. Um, and. Also, on the print side, there's not just the Make magazine. There's also, like, specialized uh, magazines that, you know, uh, focus on Raspberry Pis, on Arduino, on... Oh, see, I didn't even know that. There are alternative... Well, just <laughs> Hackaday, Hackspace. Um, yeah. There's quite a few of them. Actually. Really? Yeah. Oh. So, are we losing that much? Probably not. We, I losing, really want to say no. That beacon. That, that one bright star um, that was Make Magazine. Um, but in Aren't the end, ev everything everything's going to come to an end at some point, right? Yeah. Are you, yeah. uh, well, if I miss it, am I missing the Maker Fair itself or am I missing going there and meeting all the people that I see once or twice a year, yeah. right? And at that point, it, what's, what, what is the Maker Fair serving if it's not corporate interests? Maybe... Maybe that's why the smaller maker fairs are better. Maybe maybe they're more of the roots of making itself. Yeah. And then the question is, so Murph is growing now. Will it end up 
the next <laughs> sort of Bay Area maker first. It kind could, of. right? It could. But is 3D printing big enough for that? Well. Is there still enough hype around it? The hobbyist part of 3D printing, yeah. right? The the prosumer part of 3D printing. Uh, it's still growing. And we have kids that are growing up and going through school and a part of incredibly good STEAM classes, engineering classes. And we're going to, I think we're going to get this generational jump. And, and at some point, more people are going to know about this than don't just yeah. because of these kids now graduating, yeah. getting older, and then being like, you yeah. know what? I'm going to work in this industry. I'm going to create something in this industry. I'm going to disrupt this industry. Yeah. Agreed. So maybe not now, but I mean, like I said, we were at Murph. I, I couldn't move at Murph. It was packed with people yeah. who enjoyed it. And yeah. it's gotten more packed every year. So if that's the trend, then, then I mean... It, Goshen's in the middle of nowhere. And if it's continually being packed more and more each year, then, it, I mean, it, it must be getting more popular. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to get the right attention from, like, you know, the bigger companies. Yeah. And, everything. and I think, like, there's something here. We should get a piece of the pie. Yeah. Yeah. No. Let's hope it doesn't turn into yeah. the Bay Area Maker Fair. My fingers crossed. It's yeah. <laughs> very true. Yeah. Well, and if it does, there's always, like... It's it's natural for events companies everything just to, to grow and grow and grow because right. nobody wants wants to see like a decline in, in numbers. Um, there's going to be new events popping up like Earth is coming up and I believe that's a that's, much smaller that's event. That's October, Earth. Yeah, yeah, and it's small. I I haven't been. Did you go to Earth Not last yet. year? No, yeah. um, I, I the goal is to go this year, and it's I think it's going to feel like like a mini maker fair in that not not that so much is offered, but it's not going to feel like. Murph so much. It's just like uh, I think it's in uh, a, a convention space or yeah. some sort of arena, and uh, there are you know hard gym floors and spaces for talks oh, and nice. and lo- I, yeah. I think it's it's taking. I think Earth is taking some of the best parts of Murph and then refining the other parts to make it more wonderful. I think I don't know. I'll find out when it's I go. Sounding a lot like. 3D meetup, Sweden. Yeah, that that was the other one that was yeah. gonna, gonna bring up because that's still a very small event. Yeah. And it's yeah. very like you have the very dedicated people there who have this passion about 3D printing, you know, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and you have these workshops and these talks and it's it's nice. It's uh, it's kind of cozy in there, yeah. you know. It's it's nice it's and easy. It's not so overwhelming as the No, absolutely you get you get time to enjoy everything, talk to people, you know, take your time. That sounds wonderful. Whereas I even for Murph, Murph was overwhelming to me. Like I to me, you know. Like, so <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Should we move on with the topic? Sure. Crowley Printers is having a fire sale. That's the, <laughs> the title of the That's Reddit a heck post. of a Reddit post. Yeah, I'm going to show that to you guys. Hopefully you it's somewhat right in there. focus. Right yeah. Um, so a CR10 caught fire. Do, we, so do we, we know anything more about this? And do they specify which CR10? Like, is it the original CR10, CR10S? Was it modified? S4, S5. Is it someone with an S5 trying to print uh, ABS? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are some more details. Opening up the cable to see where the fire started. Here's the printer cable. This is a well-known issue. They use cheap cables and they usually crack and create short circuits. So people have hillbilly their own solutions by 3D printing cable guides to prevent the cable from cracking and bending a certain way. So... It sounds like this is an issue with non-proper strain relief. And that looks like it's actually, oh yeah, um, so if you look at that, that looks like the heated bed and oh, then yeah. the solder kind of wicks up yeah. into, the, into the cable and stiffens it. So there's like this yeah. one bendy point at the end where it happens. But the solder would only wick up if it got hot enough to melt the solder. Well, no, right? during soldering. There's oh, during, like, during I soldering. Think, during. It's, it's okay. What, it's kind of like happened. a slit in the, uh, in the wire there. Yeah, hmm. because it just bends so often. Yeah. It's it's just normal normal wire wear down, and the CR10 doesn't really have any strain relief. No, no, it no. has like the, the braided stuff around the cable, yeah. and that's it. Um, so, like the new the, the the later generation ones do have this sort of bracket right where the wires are solder is soldered. Yeah, uh, in order sort of to not, not have too much strain on the solder itself. But, yeah, there's still going to be that movement, and the cable is still free-falling yeah. after that. 
Okay, so we we can speculate basically about why this happened, um, and I think even the person whose printer this was um, probably doesn't have like a, a okay, this was the issue um, point to make. What what I kind of want to talk to you guys about is how can we test for these sort of things that only happen in the long run? Because if <laughs> we if we review a printer, like how long are we going to use yeah. it? Hundred print hours maybe yeah. 200 if we get i honestly uh, i whenever i do a review i try at least 1000 hours before i put out a review Ooh, that's good yeah I, that's i i that's try great to do at yeah. least 1000 hours but even at a thousand hours it's still i mean nothing. It's, it's better than than 100 but a thousand yeah. hours how many i mean of film it my my, huh? my prusa i have three or four prusa i3s um which have almost twenty thousand hours on them each and yeah that now that would be a test <laughs> like yeah. initial review after 1,000 uh, hours and then after 20,000 hours. So this is my official review of the machine. Yeah. Well, how could we how could we test for longevity at a at a like a factory QA, QA, QC sort of thing? Is there is there a way to I guess uh, if Creality could have some stress like they could pull a machine per batch and set up for stress and it would just go through heating and unheating scenarios while the bed's moving yeah, back moving, and forth yeah. or constant while the X movement. axis, just yeah. constant movement and just see, you know, have it go for months on end. Just yeah, to, I mean, you, what, I guess the proper way to do this is to have a bunch of machines just run for a while out of every iteration of the machine whenever mm -hmm. they change something, different supplier, different design, something, something, thumbs up. Uh, um, but it's not something we can replicate, I think. Not easily. It's, no. It, no. It's gonna be have it's gonna have to be something that either a reseller or the manufacturer does, and then of course we rely on the people that actually make money with those machines. <laughs> Just like here at Prusa where they have, you know, five hundred machines. Yeah. Five hundred machines yeah. going in the farm and Two another three hundred or so for personal use. Yeah, yeah. so I I guess what, what that's implying is that they are actually twenty four seven testing their machines in, mm -hmm. in a huge scale, but are they actually telling us about the issues? Are they actually fixing the stuff in the in the retail models, or it's just like, oh, okay, here we had a bit of a fire, but let's not tell anyone. But th that's probably something you can <laughs> kind of figure out from the way they do the um, iterations of the parts when they do a three or a four of a part. You can kind of tell which parts they change to make them more efficient or better or easier to print, lighter. It, it's usually the parts on the x axes, you know, and the extruder. Like right. they, they never. I, I think they only changed the um, the attachment to the heat bed once or twice in the past. Uh, with the Prusa machines. With the Prusa okay. machines. Um, so probably that's the only hint that you could tell that maybe there was something there. Um, so they decided to make better. But then again, how many people have ever reported a fire from Prusa i3? Like yeah. an original Prusa i3? I don't think any, any. right? So ultimately... It, and okay, there are a lot of them out in the world. Exactly. Over 100,000 now. 300 printers a day are shipped out from yeah. here. So, and it, well, but what we, are the... We don't know how many Creality is shipping. No, we the don't. Country, but yeah. Three, so very, okay. Well, one of the... Does Prusa or whomever is... Oh, do they owe us any of their testing statistics? Like if, if for some reason, let's say Prusa, one, one of their machines did spark or there was a little fire and they did their investigation and they found out that it was something happened that was just unique and the chances of it replicating were very very thin do they owe it to us to tell us that that happened or is that something that they just keep to themselves i i think they would i think they would it would benefit them to actually um, sure oh actually I, yes say it out loud like listen because, I, I mean, I see Prusa as the kind of company or for historically that when they make a mistake, they've always admitted it, you know, like and they fix it or at least they try to fix it. So I think it would be benefit for them if something like that had to happen and say, like, this is why we changed it. I can understand that there might be some cases where possibly they can. I mean, it's they I don't believe that they owe it to anyone okay. to say it, but I believe it would benefit them if they did, because ultimately you're you're creating trust the company because right. if there's something goes wrong I know he's going to tell me I don't disagree with you yeah. um, there is some anecdote that I want to bring into this um, that I know from my needle vacuum uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know super ten tendential but um, the thing is they, they regularly release updates for the vacuums and the, the software and all that but they don't have a change log they say okay we, we improved 
stability, like the, the, the usual thing. And the reason why people say they don't actually specify what they've improved or fixed is because of liability. Because if they actually say, okay, in, in you know, 0.01% of, of shipped uh, vacuums, we would have it chew up your dog's leg if it encountered it, <laughs> some, something like that. And out there in the wild, there was actually a case where, you know, the vacuum did run over a dog's leg and chewed it up, and, and you know, the dog is now a tripod. Um, that, you know, then, then they're, they're going to be liable for that because they, they've said out loud, yeah. okay, our machine can or could in the past do that. So... Yeah, a case might arise where someone actually did happen that yeah. that dog and say, oh, so it's so, your fault. Yeah, so uh, the, in, in that money. case, there is clear proof. So what, what manufacturers like to do is, of course, just not admit faults yeah. because it, it, it doesn't like put them out in, in, in the liability point. At the same time, you think, you know, like you always have to think that mm -hmm. there's we, we are surrounded by this community of investigators who you know <laughs> are you talking about someone specific there? <laughs> no <laughs> but in terms of like every company is dissected whatever they do whatever they release uh, a lot of people want to test everything so i think if someone <laughs> figured something out um chances are they're gonna like you know run with it and scream out loud so we probably have heard something by now at least that's that's what i think and if we heard something, then eventually we'd stop hearing about it. Because it was oh, well, that's like saying uh, if aliens existed, we would have heard something by now, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, conspiracy theories aside. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe we have heard. Uh, maybe. Maybe. We I know. Mean, I, we just, I, we've been wiped clean. I, you, you, <laughs> what? Who are you? <laughs> Look into the light. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so... Conclusion, we, we can't really do anything. We have to trust companies to actually make a good product. Now, the okay, well, one, more, one more thing I can, I can make on that point of uh, the long-term stuff is just experience. Um, we, as people who have seen a lot of printers, can, can look at, okay, what issues certain designs tend to have. Mm -hmm. For example, PrintaBot didn't used to have any cable strain relief. Um, so in the stepper motors, you know, the, the wires would just bend around constantly, and that's the point where, it, where you know, wires break, like here with the, with the CR10. Right. So in my reviews, I always point that out. If there is no proper cable management or, or strain relief, if there's just nothing there to support the wires, um, people always go like, eh, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's, it's, it's fine. It's why, why are you so pedantic about that? I'm like, yeah. Mm. It might there, be fine for a bit until it's not, exactly, and exactly. then it's really not. If you treat it as a throwaway product that you know only needs to work for your first three spools until you lose interest, then yeah, it's fine. It's fine, but <laughs> it's an issue with the machine, and yeah, it's going to be more expensive if you actually fix all these issues. Right. So, well, I mean, really, we it would it would be the manufacturer having stress machines per iteration, like you yeah. mentioned. Or it would be re like it would be like tiny machines. Every time a new CR10 iteration came out, it'd be them having stress machines if they wanted to provide better customer trust, yeah. I suppose. Or it would be up to people at home just just keeping stats on how often it's run and taking uh, uh, taking their machines yeah. and looking at them, being like, "Well, this is." This looks good. This this doesn't look good. Uh, yeah, but I who think, does that? No, I, I yeah. certainly don't, and you don't. Especially with, with cables. Like, you're not going to cut yeah. your cable open and yeah. go like, oh, yeah. of these 20 strands, two yeah. have failed. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, that's the thing with, like, I, like now we were quite um, aware of how Prusa works and the, the assembly lines and the testing. And the thing is, okay, everything is tested. Like, the power supply, you know, it's cycled, and, and the heat uh, cartridges are cycled to see if they work. Yeah. But, like, is, is that enough of a testing? But then again, are you going to test every single heater cartridge for cycles no, for 20,000 well, hours? Yeah. You can't. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a QC topic on its own. Yeah. That, that there are people who specialize in just yeah, that exactly. stuff. There are companies who specialize in, in how to do QC properly. But usually, I mean, what's done is you have, like, single or a small subset of samples that you actually test until yeah. they fail. And then out of a batch, you test, I don't know, 1% if, yeah. if you're good or even less. And if those pass the things you're looking for, then the rest of the batch is probably going to be fine as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one last short news topic. Um, a Twitter user, Phelan Faley, uh, is stealing photos from other Twitter users to promote a printer that 
those photos have nothing to do with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, you you have some background on that. Yeah, I, so, I, I noticed what was going here. on, and I did my best to approach this person over Twitter as as uh, a point of reason and someone who who could carry on some sort of conversation because uh, for sure the it was uh the feb feb top fab top i think feb top and and fell and phil uh they were sharing images and they were giving hints that these were coming from their machines and it was very proven by certain community members that yeah. there were images that they were posting that were definitely not from their yeah. machines and taken from other people in the community. And so, I mean, crazy words were exchanged. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some people were blocked. Um, I did my best to reach out to this person. Um, I, I used their own words back to them in a way of saying, look, you're, you're calling for all of us to be better, but you need to also be better. Oh, door closed. Uh, <laughs> so, so in knowing that, um, uh, I, I think they got the point. And uh, I, they did send me an email, ask if I could review their printer because they they do need some some eyes on it, and that, I haven't responded that, yet because I haven't had the chance. That sort of approach sounds familiar. <laughs> Artillery. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I. Oh, by the way, since since you're already talking about us, can you like promote our printer by review? <laughs> it's it. <sighs> I. I don't think that person, I think that person exists in a vacuum. And I think that initially they thought that they could just, hey, I'm excited about this stuff. Uh, here are some cool images. We can talk about our machine and show off these cool images. What could go wrong? And then when people started calling that person on it, that person started saying not nice things back to to yeah. people. So it's like, oh, okay, at this point, you're upsetting the community that you're trying to befriend and get to buy your product. So what's going on? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. The internet always remembers, but sometimes the internet forgets. Yes. And uh, I forgot about this until you brought it up. Yeah. I, I To be completely honest, I wasn't even aware of this um, for the past couple of weeks. I've been kind of dormant on Twitter. Um, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's not the first time that it happened, and I don't believe it's the last time that it's yeah. going to happen. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, when you have pe the, there are um, a number of people who are or who print amazing models yeah. with wonderful filaments, and they take professional photos yeah. of them and release them online. At some point, some company or person is going to take one of those images and use it as one of their own. So maybe own. we should start promoting the watermark effect. On those photos. <laughs> yeah. Well, watermark not just the photo, but the print itself. Yeah, maybe? the print itself. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's ways you can embed stuff or or yeah, just do velocity or... printing over your your stuff. That's right. <laughs> there you go. It's it's sad, and it's sad. It had to come to the point it did because so many people called that person out, and and was like, "Yo, you're you're stealing these images." Yeah. And uh, I mean, I guess it's not happening right now. Yeah. But uh, the, I, I don't know. See, I mean, when it, it happened, sucked. so for those unaware, this happened with our artillery, 3D. Yeah. Um, they had posted a post on Facebook showing um, a print by F Tom, Filament Frenzy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, now, uh, being the devil's advocate, the way it was worded, it could have been easily uh, construed as this was printed with an artillery uh, Sidewinder X1 which obviously it wasn't. It was Tom who had printed on a different printer. They were called out throughout the community. They apologized. They removed it. They sent Tom a 3D printer as an apology. And I mean, and not only that, but it seems like it kind of now worked in their favor because that, that machine actually now has um, more, uh, how do you say, it's been recognized more. More people are believing in it. <laughs> it's a massive it's actually, following. Yeah. It's, actually, like it's, it's so been considered as I, like the, not CR10, but what's, yeah, a, what's exactly. a big one? The CR10 S Pro? No, the, 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 the other one from Creality. Uh, forget. Big guy. No. Whatever. No, the, the CR10 is the big one. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. Okay, right, right, right. So uh, Artillery had inundated mm -hmm. me with at least 15 to 20 emails a day <laughs> for about three weeks asking me to review this, and I refused to do it simply for them spamming my email. And after this happened, and I saw how they spoke back to Tom, the way they treated Tom, I told them, listen, okay, you know what? Send one over, and I'll test it out. And I'm still using it. It has over 1,000 hours on it. Review coming out soon. But 
it kind of worked in their favor because of how they react to the way could the community reacted. So if you make a mistake, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They made a mistake. They shouldn't have done that, but they kind of, you know, they fessed up to it. They apologized. And I think they treated Tom fairly for how it went down. But, sure. Uh, but it's not right. Uh, you know, in, in these two situations, someone said, yo, artillery, what are you doing? And yeah. I, they apologized. They took it down. They offered to, to send Tom a printer. Whereas this other person, hey, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, it's like, just... screw you guys. Fly higher than eagles. You guys, yeah. you know, whatever. Block, block, block. Yeah. So uh, while while the initial condition was the same, I think artillery handled it way, way better. better. <laughs> way, way better. better. Way better. Yeah. And not only that, and now the company is growing even more because... Um, they're going all out doing the right thing, releasing the source code of the printer. Whenever there's an update, they tell the community yeah. constant updates on the Facebook group. So it's like, wow, okay, it's, it, this company seems to be doing everything right now. Artillery is a <laughs> contender. Yeah, it, absolutely. They are, they are. And I honestly speaking, I look forward to them uh, releasing Core XY, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> all right. How are we doing on time? I don't know. 39 minutes. We're good. 39 minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess one last thing for the stolen photos is, you know, looking at the Phil and Philly account, I've, I've looked at this one when the original thing came up and I'm looking at it now again. It's like that there's, there's 50 posts a day of retweets of all sorts of random stuff. There's photos of cows. zoo animals, cows, <laughs> waterfalls, Ugandan football. When I looked at it, some of the posts were politically charged as well. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they just look random. So I got, I got a question, like, is that actually a real account? Or is it just some sort of, hey, I'm going to post so much stuff out there um, and, and create a, a burner account or some fake, bloated, whatever account? Is I... that actually a real person tweeting all this? I think it's a real person because I talked to a person. But it could be there's a chance that it's a real person who has some sort of bot or script to run every day to post about Absolutely. certain things. And then it just so happened that we interacted with the real, real person, person in charge of that account. Yeah. That's what I, that's kind of what I think. It's the, the entire thing is just, uh, to me, it's just super fishy. <laughs> uh, I haven't responded to the email yet. Political student vocal about change in leadership. Like, it, and it's 8,500 followers. So, but well, then again, if you retreat something every day for two times about absolutely every any topic in the yeah. world, you know. <laughs> 6,300 tweets, which isn't that much, actually. But, yeah, I have way more uh, than that. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, as, as so many things on the internet, it's hard to really wrap your head around what's really right. going on yeah. and to find ground truth. It's... Like, honestly, I would love to sit down with that dude and talk to him face to face for a half yeah. hour and just 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 find out how he ticks. I'd yeah. love I'd love to see how that's him. find o out how opening up. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> just just kind of just like, and what? then plug it in and be like, mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, and for a big, big, big ish topic for the last 20 minutes that we have. Um, since I have you two here. Let's talk about the future of 3D printing. No. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I, I could have picked a broader topic. Um, <laughs> Not really. And unfortunately, we don't have Stefan with us today, um, but he's with, with us in, in the spirit. Um, and what he put in there, I think that's his wording. Making 3D printers more efficient, belt printers, automatic print platform changes, etc. So is that actually going to be something that we're going to be seeing more in printers where the printer just manages itself? itself. Mm -hmm. Or is that a gimmick that you only need if you're really running a production? So I, I keep I brought this up with with Joe Prusch as well because when I was here last year there was this guy who did this um, this automatic take off the bed ones the I Prusch I three oh yeah a, a hand comes takes off the bed puts it in like can, place, can he actually talk about that? The, well, well, it was there at the fair. Oh, it was at the fair. Okay. Oh yeah, this wasn't a lab thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. just, was, just I checking. actually showed a video of it last year right. uh, on the Maker Fair, and like it slides in, it takes the bed out, moves it, and gets a clean one, and puts it right. down, and starts printing again, and everything. And that is that 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 would be awesome. Like for someone like me who runs a farm, for like, oh, yes, please. Yeah, because you actually part of your job 
as a uh, well, as a part timer. Yeah, <laughs> or, uh, yeah. You, you're actually printing stuff as a as like a, uh, for customers prototyping, print house, yeah, whatever whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So yeah, I have I have ten producers at home. I keep three in my office. Those you bought. Projects. I bought every yeah. so every <laughs> single item that I have, which has the Prusa logo on it, I have purchased, even <laughs> though. Joe Prusha thinks I'm a mistake, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I've purchased every single one of them. That kind of tells people how much I believe in the machines. But uh, but then again, they're the ones I use in the farm because I know they're reliable, they're right. consistent, and whatever I tell them to print, they print. Um, and so it's having something like that which automates it, oh, it's like mm. my wife would love me so much for that. I don't have to call her up. Could you go and check? What the prints are at, yeah. they're finished. Take them off, clean the bed <laughs> for a start. <laughs> yeah. So that is that is one future of yeah. 3D printing. But is that going to be the future? Uh, no. No. Um, because then again, there is the belt printers now, like the White Knight. And that kind of yeah. cancels the fact of like the, the removing the bed and everything. Like, you know. I mean, there have been belt printers before. Yeah. Uh, the Thingomatic, of course. Yeah, the, sure. The original patented uh, design that now nobody can use, so all the printers are 45 degree That's angle. That's right. Um, that and that there were, I think, a few others. But uh, one of the issues was always that the, the bed, you know, started curling up and there was a titanium sheet underneath and then capped it on top. And over time, it would crinkle and do all sorts yeah. of weird stuff. So with the White Knight, because it is such a large machine, it is physically impressive. Yeah. Um, I think you, 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 you're working around many of those issues. Yeah. Um, but with a non-patented design with 45 yeah. degrees, you also have other issues yeah. of Absolutely. now that the overhangs are, are all weird and screwy and you have to work your model for, for printing. I think it's Has like, anyone it's ever curious. explained why it's a 45 degree angle? I mean, you can still do it. Like, well, it's like 60 or whatever, but it, it just can't yeah, be Yeah, but like, why can't it be perpendicular? Like Because that's patented. Because MakerPod has patented that. Oh, okay. So, like, you can do it, like, can't you do it, like, 89.9 degrees <laughs> instead of uh, 90? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've not read the patent. I've patent. seen videos also of a guy who inserts G-code at the end uh, of the print. Once it's done, it waits until the bed cools down and then just grabs the uh, the hot end and knocks it off. It knocks yeah, yeah that, it just... that's been that's been uh, on Sanjay's from E3D's channel from like 10 years ago. Oh, wow. They actually okay. have like a, a, a aluminum blade or just a wiper in front of the hot end that just goes like Poop, and that pushes awesome. it out. That I was on, on a Metal 90. As well. <laughs> yeah, back when the Metal 90 was still hot. <laughs> well, are we talking about the future of 3D printing in the, like the consumer and the prosumer side or more of the industrial oh, additive manufacturing yeah. it's side? It's different futures, right? It, there's there's two different futures here because uh, I went to Rapid in, in Detroit, yeah. Rapid TCT, and I saw these amazing, these amazing machines that cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. And... Obviously, sintering metal and nylons is a definite future of yeah. 3D. Like professionally, like in, at large volume, that is definitely a future of 3D printing. Yeah. And it's going to be the future of many different sectors like uh, medicine and aerospace and yeah. automotive. But on the hobbyist, I say hobbyist, the garage tinkerer, right? The, that side. Um, I think that the future there is going to be the proliferation of more cool materials yeah. with different mechanical properties that are more easily printed on machines that are more easily used. But do you feel that, do you think that there's going to be this transition where the, the commercial side of it gets things before the makers get them? So like, you know, like 10 years ago to get a 3D printer, uh, it costed thousands upon mm -hmm. thousands, you know, and back then only companies could afford them for prototyping. But along the years, you know, they become so cheap that us makers now just buy them on a whim. <laughs> um, so maybe in five, 10 years time, these sintering machines um, will cost much less. Well, the, uh, like from Centurit. Well, Centurit has the Lisa, <laughs> yeah. which is a $5,000 yeah, exactly, sintering machine. Exactly, yeah. And um, what was it canceled? F didn't Form uh, Form Labs had one? I wasn't sure if it got canceled or not. I'm not sure about. They, form but they had that, their their an SLS machine. But I think I think what's going to happen is we're going to have really cool SLS technologies in the in the industrial side, yeah. and I think some of that is going to get adapted, and we're going to start to see that in the hobbyist yeah. side and the prosumer side. But 
I think the future of the hobbyist, the prosumer side is going to be the plastic extrusion. I think we're always going to have that heating of the plastic and melting it into shapes because that's the most cost effective way to prototype things. And it still produces amazing functional parts. Yeah. um, I disagree. (laughs) Ooh. Um, I don't think. So, yes, I I agree with the part that uh, filament based printers are going to be the machine to go to for a long, long while, but not because of cost, because cost comes from volume, basically. And, you know, it doesn't matter that it's that it's filament uh, printing right now, (laughs) as I'm looking at the wall of filament behind me. Um, That stuff got cheap because it's it's not made in volume. It's also a, a, a cheap, you know, base material, of course. But if you look at like nylon powders, it's the same stuff. Essentially, it's just a, a, some polymer that is formed into a powder that is somewhat consistent. Um, the problem that I have with resin printing and metal powder printing and nylon powder printing is that it's messy. It's so um, messy. Yeah. Both both with resin, you get resin everywhere, even if you have like a, well, maybe if you have something like a, a form um, machine uh, or the, the BSL one with the clean, cleaning and curing station, maybe that kind of makes it less messy but that's messy powders get everywhere you have to clean it you have to wear your protective equipment it's just well metal powders they can ca- they can me- combust well that too yeah metal powders are, are just a huge risk to have in your home even if it was more affordable I mean, large surface area then you know every metal kind of burns if you took um, steel wool and kind of lit it on fire yeah that stuff burns it burns like like tinder mm-hmm yeah. um yeah, so the, the the I think that that's the bigger push factor than that. Um, I think that's more of a case what I'd like to see happening. Yeah. In the future, um, and that is like like for example, SLA is gaining quite a bit of momentum now within the hobby market, much more so than it was before. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely! Like the anacubic photon has been there now for a couple of years. But it still hasn't. Wow, a couple of years. Yes. Yeah, wow. and, and similar machines too. Yeah, and it. It's been there for a year and a half for sure. I did my review of it a year and a half ago. It's been there. It's the same price. But only recently has SLA started gaining much more attention because more companies are adapting to it. More companies like uh, the Zotrax Inspire, mm-hmm. the Prusa uh, SL1, they're making it easier. Um, sure. It's, it's still messy. It's still a hassle. But I'd like for it to be like clean and easy. And I'd like for someone to figure out how to do like multi-material <laughs> with SLA. I think that Ooh, would be awesome. Yeah. Well, I don't. Form know. is working on that. Or th- there was some some company had a two tank system. Yeah, where it could move. Yeah, yeah. To, that would be awesome. But I, it's going to be messy as. <laughs> it, it sounds like a huge pain in the huge yes. waste of material. Yeah. You have to clean off your part yeah, every exactly. time you move from that to that. You know, to your point though. Uh, we have the Wazer, right? Which is water jet cutting at home. And that was always known on the industrial side to be a very messy procedure. Yeah. Water with a bunch of particulates in it. And you had to find a way to clean it up and, and dispose of it properly. And and yet we have the Wazer water jet cutter, the home-based thing you can have in your garage. Bob, I like to make stuff. He's got one. Yeah. Oh. And so I think, well, I, I agree with you to a point. I think that, I think that, messiness if it can be controlled in a better way is possible uh just like with form with the automatic resin dispersion yeah. into the the tank um i think i think the titanium powders are always going to be dangerous i think i think metal sintering at home it's is, is always nature. it's just yeah. it's it's going to be way better to not do it i mean there, there's going to be people that always try to do something at home <laughs> like that but but i think i think there's going to be more SLS nylon powder sintering at home. Yeah. I think I think that is the the danger isn't enough with nylon powder. It's not going to combust. I don't think. Right? I don't think nylon powder think will combust. Could, even even in a cloud, maybe. I don't. I, I don't know. But not as much as it's not. T- stuff yeah. can can combust. In sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Try it out. Uh, I think though, <laughs> that's true. Uh, I, I think there's a future there. A little one in in home based stuff. I, I think plastic extrusion is always going to be the king yeah, of yeah. home based additive manufacturing. But I, I mean, we might just like with the Wazer water jet, we may see a like the center at Lisa or another machine that's like, yes, we know it's messy. Yes, it's not for everyone, but you know there are people that want to do this at home, yeah. and now you can. So I can tell you with with SLA, there's one thing that bothers. I I don't mind 
taking off the prints and dipping it in alcohol and cleaning yeah. up. It's easy. The one thing that really gets to me is if I want to change the resin. That is the biggest hassle because I have to stay emptying the vat. I have to make sure you use a funnel and oh. cleaning off and, and then getting wipes with IPA, cleaning it off, make sure it's clean again. And then, then I think that's the worst part. See, the way the form solves that is you buy multiple vats and yeah. you have a vat per material. Yeah, how much is the vat? They call them a tank. Well, it's expensive. <laughs> Just like everything that form does is expensive. But yeah. remember, form is an ecosystem. Yeah, true. Right? For, we have the Form 2, and you have their wash station, and you have their curing station, and you have their software, yeah. and it's it's an ecosystem. Yeah. But we happen to have the SL1 and the cleaning station and yeah. the software, and they're, I don't know, uh, maybe, maybe there's something there. Yeah. We'll see. Um, the other thing that, that that's coming up, Aside from SOA and SOS and film and printing is all the, the hybrid stuff um, where you print like a, f a metal loaded filament and then that gets post processed. Oh, um, yeah. Diabetes. Yeah, the Diabase machine, that yeah. the H series is a great example. Yeah. Or, or even the Z Morph, right? Z Morph. Z Morph, yeah. Oh, yes. A lot of stuff like that. And or just, you know, sandpaper. Yes. <laughs> and blisters. <laughs> Yeah, but, but out of those, you, you get an actual metal part. Sure. It doesn't have any, any binders in it. I so see what you're that, saying. That gets yeah, yeah, yeah. Out. But the thing is, so those processes need some sort of centering, post-processing. But SLS with metal powders um, also need that post-processing to get full yeah. strength. So like you can yeah. have a really weak, spongy part. If you just take it out of the machine, you need, I don't know, Stefan can talk about this uh, for hours. Um, because he actually does that for his job. Right. Um you need like some high pressure, high temperature oven to recenter the part, and it, it kind of shrinks. And that's not probably not something that the home or well, the consumer user is. Well, the machine that I detailed that was close to me that actually laid the metal powders with the the nylon or the the particulates that were actually like a support mechanism. And then you take in a crucible, which you take, and then you fire, and then you you can calculate the shrinkage, and then you have a, a stainless steel part or whatever. So it's possible. Was it make, make Mark Forge? Yeah, they, they've that, got something, yeah. They've got that machine that was at the Sweden meetup. It actually prints 100% metal through FDM. Yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? That would that was just mind blowing. Like they they printed this benchy with supports and everything, and then they they cook it, and it dissolves all the chemicals that sort of put the uh, like like uh, that bind the mm -hmm. the the. the, the the dust of the metal yeah. particles and everything cooks it in this oven that costs like a half a million euro or something like that. Um, but I mean, you're FDM printing metal, yeah. right. hundred percent metal, yeah. and that's that's. I want that. Yeah. But where's the advantage of doing that over uh, laser sintering the metal? Yeah, I believe it's it's cheaper Is in it? materials Is it? because okay. your, your powder doesn't have to be so precisely controlled in, in grain size. Uh, okay, at, at least that's what I understand. Hmm. See, that's interesting. Yeah. And and you know you're gonna spend like what a quarter of a million euro to print a metal benchy. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> sure. So that that's on the that's on the industrial side. Um, but what about the the consumer? Because what what I think we're seeing right now is, is really a race to the bottom. How cheap of a printer can you yeah. still make and have it be a printer that people will yeah enjoy or recommend at least. Um, is is there much more room below two hundred US dollars for for an N three or something like that? Because we we've seen how bad it can get with the A eight. Yeah. Um, uh, that's tough because the Ender three is arguably a more loved machine than the A net machines, yeah, and for sure. it is inexpensive. And it is very mod friendly, yeah. and a lot of people get a lot of really good prints Fully out of it. Fully open source. Fully open That's source. True, yeah. uh, was it the open software hardware? Everything. The, yeah, it's, yeah, the it's OSHA. Yeah, OSHA. Yeah. Yeah. First, uh, the OSHA. Yeah, OSHA so. Their yeah. patent, like their certification is 001, I think. That's like, right. Yeah. It's, it's the is first OSHA. No, I, I thought 001 was load spot. In China? No, no, in oh, China. No, in China. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In China. China. Okay. Uh, right. So while it's. <laughs> I don't know if you can 
start to get cheaper than that because that that is a Chinese company producing that machine in Shenzhen. So it's like there there's no there's no better recipe to make a machine for the lowest cost possible. Yeah. It yeah. seems, and so and they're still producing a low cost machine, and they still have a company. And they employ people, so they must yeah. be making enough of a profit off of this yeah. to, to be able to do that. I think we kind of we saw a divide. There was a there was a divide between the hobbyist and the prosumer, and it it was uh, like it was it was the difference between a a Prusa machine and maybe like a Lulzbot Test Six or yeah. an Ultimaker Two Plus or yeah. something like that. And now, like that divide grew, and now we have an Ultimaker S. Five, which is six grand, and we have the it's raised crazy. Pro Two Plus, which is six thousand, and the yeah. the Taz Seven or the Workhorse, which is yeah. like five thousand. And yeah. so, yeah. and so, well, I, I think we've kind of seen the race to the bottom, and we we kind of know what it looks like now, and it's starting to stabilize. But we seem to have this growing divide where companies that that couldn't adapt to the lower price and they couldn't produce at the higher price had to pivot or else they were going to die. Just like Robo. Where did the, uh, other than the Robo R2 just being a pile of garbage for me, what did Robo do? They stopped supporting it. They stopped making it. They white labeled a machine from Flashforge or from uh uh what was it? The the Monoprice, the Monoprice yeah. Voxel. They white labeled that and then packed it with a bunch of learning and teaching material for teachers and then started going to the education market. So so uh, I while I, I know I know we had a race to the bottom and I, I we may have finished that race. Right. We may know what it looks like now. And we've had companies that have moved to more of a of a professional sector. Ultimaker, Lulzbot, Raise 3D, any of those machines in that yeah. price range. And so anything that got caught in the middle, I think, had to adapt. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's why that's why that's why I think Prusa is so successful at what he does, is because he's offering not the cheapest solution, no. but it's an incredibly high performing solution at not it's, the highest it price. Has, it yeah. feels like it kind of have the has the perfect balance of all the things you want out of a 3D printer. With the kind of right cost associated to it, with the support to back it up and everything, it's like it's like a package deal. Yeah, you know? yeah. you're you're paying for what you get. So you know. who's the Prusa but, but, of this market? That, that's probably going to pick up on Mike. Oh, sorry. <laughs> who's the Prusa? <laughs> so, so who's the Prusa? So sorry we have for the last forty five minutes of that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's probably not loud. Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> But if we have this divide, okay, I won't touch the table anymore. If we have this divide and it grew like this and we have the race to the bottom here on this side and maybe like the Prusa on this side or the the high price, the higher price CR10 machines from Creality on this side, right? So then on this side of it, the prosumer market, who's the who's the Prusa? Maybe Prusa should also be the Prusa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see. Um I mean, one one more point towards the the race to the bottom is there is only so low you can go with a certain weight machine. Right. <laughs> At some point, you, you most of your cost is going to be shipping, uh, yeah. shipping components to the factory. Well, of course, in, in China, yeah. it's it's all local, but shipping materials buying raw materials at, at some point you're going to get, get to the scrap value of, of your machine basically that you're selling it for but then also shipping it out to europe the u.s uh yeah. elsewhere yeah. and that that's more of a cost than you may yeah. think it is for most printers actually i remember in the beginning when the ender 3 came out i had started a discussion i can't remember with who who said uh, that uh, this person was um uh, he was dealing with creality to start sourcing their machine and where through the grain fine was that the Ender 3 was never meant to continue this long because it was too expensive to produce for the price it was. I heard sold. that. I've heard that argument. Yeah. So ultimately, they were losing money. It was just there to sort of like give a boost to Creality yeah. and then jump onto the CR20 bandwagon, which is the CR20 is an Ender 3, but it looks just much nicer. Yeah. Um, so what happened was the Ender 3 be like, you know, blew up, like as in, oh, wait, blew up as in. <laughs> The popularity blew up. <laughs> and then they started shipping more of them, putting further discounts, but then they started cutting corners. Because then there was the issue with the yeah. uh, with the XD60. Oh, that's right. Not being soldered and then fires. Like, this happens quite a lot with connectors catching fire. Like, yeah. a lot of them. There hasn't been, like, a really expensive. bad... Yeah. yeah. There hasn't been, like, a really bad incident. But I see at least two posts today with someone complaining that uh, they, they burnt out. Yeah. 
So I, I I don't know. I think it's it's there. The under three is there because it has to be there for the company to sort of keep on. Wow, yeah. it's just my theory. Because I I heard it from more than one person that they were making a loss. And that was in the beginning when it was like $189 or something like that. So basically, if you bought a, um, an Ender 3 in the early days, you made one heck of a deal. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because basically, you you were getting subsidized by Creality. And Pretty yeah. much. And, they had, know, like, and, and it was somewhere. really, like, everything was fine. Everything was sold there properly, the connectors and everything. So. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But cost down measures aren't something that's, like, out of the ordinary. Yeah. It's something no. every company does. Sooner or later. Yeah. Um, it's just, okay, is it at the expense of quality? I, I think no. it's always going to be at the expense of quality. Or, or after the quality comes the QA, and maybe that's where. Yeah. Maybe you just have a new supply that are manufacturing somewhere else and yeah. they're cheaper. Yeah. You know, that, that can that can happen too, and I've, I've seen that happen. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, um, so race to the bottom. We said, okay, shipping is, is, a, is a huge part of the price. Um but what's also part of the price is all the development, all the support, all the you know documentation, all that. Um, are we starting to see a lack of innovation and a lack of, of just new developments because the companies have much less budget to spend as we're sitting in Prusa's lab, we're literally employing <laughs> dozens of, of yeah. people just for developing new stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's, is, it's, it's really uh, because for the last couple of years nothing new sort of no new styles of mm. printer i have no idea why not every single company has started now producing a core xy because okay the cartesian i think we've reached like the <laughs> y- 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 there's not much more you can do with a cartesian right. like faster you know core xy like let's let's get there already <laughs> like i want let's start with the budget core xy let's see how much like a, a race to the bottom for a core xy is going to be like maybe tronxy with the x5 sa has it Oh, with yeah. With the 12, 24 volt heat bed and a 12 volt power supply. <laughs> with the untuned pods on the stepper motors that shift whenever they move. <laughs> but it's a $250 Core XY machine. Yeah. You know, you have the basis. Like, start changing things, spend another couple of hundred euros, and you have yourself a half decent Core XY. But I think there has to be that shift now. I think cart- Cartesians, we're done. Let's. Let's move on. Yeah, um, but that's just a that's just a different approach. I mean, Core XY isn't anything that that's like radically new no, and, no, and, and but developed. Core XY has been out there for for a long, long time. It's just that somebody's all suddenly picking it up and saying, "Oh, yeah, this is this is better," and it is better or different in, in many ways. But it's not like <sighs> no, there's no revolution. To yeah, it's, it's it's it didn't take any development effort no. to get that out there. No. Nope. Um, I guess what else? I, what, what sort of innovations would we see, though? <laughs> <laughs> I know where we're all which, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> which in- innovations can, uh, will we see that we can talk about? <laughs> uh, well, this yeah, this, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's gonna have to be details. Yeah, it's it's existing problems that are being solved one way that are you know that that have the potential to be solved more elegantly or at a lower cost or a lower component count yeah um because is is there well if if we knew that then we would do it but is there anything that that really radically different that that needs to be done in 3d printing or in fdm 3d printing which which we're part of here um is there like any part that we go okay this is this is still bad that needs improving uh i i don't i mean I don't know, right? Because yeah. everything that I use the machines for is... I, I don't have a need for anything greater at this time. Yeah. And that's not to say that I do extreme stuff with mine, but I'm I'm pretty sure more people are like me than not, yeah. right? So then... What there is works. Yeah. How, I, I, I mean, I mean how I mean, many innovations have there been to the hammer? Lighter, I guess. Yeah. And well, a better nail pull. Lighter hammer. Yeah. It needs to be... Exactly. Well, maybe maybe lighter, but still having striking force. Yeah. See, I don't know. A printer just needs to print. Yeah, and at this point, I think the FDM printer really does that, yeah. or can do that. Like, not every printer does it, but there are printers out there that just do that. You you pick them up, you you slice something, you print it, and it's done. You 
I think the only way to improve upon the current existing 3D printers is just the usability aspect of it. A lot yeah. of people s still don't understand the amount of hand handiwork, like the hands-on stuff that goes in to owning a 3D printer. You, you can't just buy a 3D printer and then it gets a jam and that's it, I'm done. <laughs> like, I don't know how to fix this. Like, it's, I think it's stuff like that that needs to be improved now. Yeah, but it's, it's not revolutionary. It's no, revolutionary. it's not. It's, it's small no. bits that get better here and there. Yeah. But I think that's something that has stayed the same. Like, the way a hot end works, like, you know? It, yeah. It, the way it's, it's assembled. You have the nozzle that goes into the heat block, and that's where usually jams happen, and maybe that's what needs to be changed to make it well, easier. I'm, for well, it. I mean, the, the mosquito, right? That's a different approach to the hot end. Yeah, but it's still essentially functionally, it's still the same. Functionally the six, same, right? It's yeah. got a heater block. It's got the same compatible nozzles. Yeah. Got some sort of heat break and the heat sink on it. But I mean, but it's it's, it's a small just, change, like you said. Exactly. It's, it's a small so, change. Yeah. I think FDM being able to print faster, more, more print faster, more reliably, or hotter. I think that's that's like the next. Yeah. That's where we go, because we've got larger. We've yeah. got smaller, we've got big and larger nozzles, we've got the ability to print hotter in certain yeah. machines, uh, maybe extrusion consistency, maybe yeah. geared stuff, maybe the, I don't know, is Bontech the way to go? Maybe, yeah. is there is there improvements that can happen in there? I don't know, Railcore seems to be getting it, though, in terms of speed. I've seen that thing print, like, stupid fast. Yeah. And it's, so it's it's Core X Y right yeah and uh, it's a it's usually it's it's Bontech it's Bontech on an E3D or a Mosquito yeah. that's right that's right and a do it board yeah I mean and, 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 and every, it's like all aluminium you know it's and it's got the, aluminum the bed uh, is it with that so that's not bed leveling that's bed tramming right yeah. because it's gonna make that bed perpendicular well, to the nozzle yeah. really. well nothing I know yeah. I know but <laughs> but rather than mechanical tramming not auto yeah, yeah right it's gonna level the plane to the nozzle and make it perpendicular yeah. instead of making the nozzle follow the yeah. the bed. And so maybe that's it. Maybe maybe that's what needs to happen to more machines. Maybe have a five axis, five D printer. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> like there was there was this printer once that was showcased where the model is so the nozzle is kind of fixed, and it's the model that rotates, so you yeah. never need supports. So it's that that. Not, it's like a, it a delta. A, it was like a delta. Yeah, six axis delta. The thing. the belt actually moves. Was that the one that was at CES? That one. Time? Was it at CES? You have the the delta mechanism at the top, but then you also have like a three axis yeah. bed. Oh um, oh, so there's a, when there's it, a that was at Murph, I think, wasn't it? So if it prints What's sideways, it? what so. it does is, is it the bed tilts. It, it sounds just, so familiar, like I've seen it somewhere. It was a red machine. I remember it. It, it was, was red. red. Okay, it was red. That's all. Can't remember the name of it though. I can't either. Oh, dang yeah, it. But, something like that. But but I think for, for, to make that happen, it's not going to be a Creality that makes that happen. Oh, it's no. not going to be an Ain't It or Creality is going to be one that copies it. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> it needs to be some big company that yeah. pushes that, that idea and develops it and puts it into, into the market and, and refines the idea yeah. until it's at a point where you know, others can yeah, copy exactly. it. Yeah. But they need to have the budget to, to actually develop it first. Otherwise, we're not... We're not going to see anything <laughs> new. <laughs> right. All right. Cool. Um, one last thing I, I want to clarify. Why are you the mistake? Oh, <laughs> we, we God. Into this and I, okay. I I so let's. Like, okay. Okay. So I, when I was at Murph, I spoke to Joe Prusha very briefly. Um, he asked me if I'm coming over for Prague Maker Fair. And uh, I said, I don't know, are you bringing me over for Prague Maker Fair? I told him, you know, I'm a cheap date. You know, I'll take the attic. <laughs> and he said, we'll sort something out. I'm like, okay. So then Martin messages me by email. He, he's like, um, um, Joe said that uh, we should start sorting out something for you to come over to Prague Maker Fair. Like, have you decided on anything? I told him it was a very brief discussion at Murph. You should probably ask him. And he said he's away around right now, and once he's back, I'll confirm. So a week <laughs> later, he's back from Japan, and I told Michael, like, have you spoken to Joe? He's like, yes, I would like to officially invite you to Prague Maker Fair and give me your details, your passport, and the dates. I'm like, yay, okay, we're off to Maker Fair. Um, so apparently, in the background, what was happening is Joe tells Martin... Invite over 3D printing nerd. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Martin said in his mind, 3D printing now, 3D maker noob. It's the uh, same yeah. thing. It's the same thing. So first night we're here on Friday having a drink. Joe, well, like, we're all, you know, having lots of gin. And he goes, well, you're a mistake. <laughs> you weren't supposed to be here, but I'm happy you are. <laughs> so, yeah, there, that's that's. So now that's going to be the rest of my life yeah. uh, with Prusa. I'm the mistake. So. Well, the 3D M N, right? 3D, right. 3D mistake. 3D mistake noob. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah. All right, but I'm I'm glad that you made it. I'm glad yeah, that, yeah, I'm that glad to be here. It was awesome. Invited. It was yeah. awesome, especially that Joel was here as well. Like having the the Americans over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, Europe is small, and the Americans are having a, a hard time wrapping their head around <laughs> the size of. It's of really the small. Content. It's yeah. really really small, yeah. and and the distances between things aren't nearly as much as yeah. the distances. I drove here this morning. I know <laughs> from Germany. <laughs> And I'm going to drive back this, uh, this night, <sighs> afternoon. We'll see. <laughs> I'll night, night afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. It's all the same. You sleep on someone's floor. <sighs> yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It was great having you two here. Um, I guess I guess you, you all watching or listening know where to find you. But just to reiterate, Joel, where can people find you? Uh, if you go to YouTube and you look up 3D Printing Nerd, that's a good way to find me. Also, the 3dprintingnerd.com. <laughs> Yeah, and social media also. And social media, oh, that's right, at Joel Telling, J-O-E-L-T-E-L-L-N-G. Instagram is the same. Um, Don't you have like a a 3D uh, printing nerd Twitter as well? I do. I just grabbed it because uh, I have the trademark, and so someone else squatted on it and so I, my lawyer sent a nasty letter and I, oh, I got it back so okay, I just I, yeah I have to I, I, I thought that was intentional to spread like private and, and, and YouTube stuff and don't forget you have technically nerdy I do stuff. have technically nerdy That's the second YouTube channel is. where we get nerdy technically yeah, cool yeah. and where can you find you uh, I'm Joe I'm 3D Maker Noob or Mistake Noob whichever 3D MN uh, you can find me on YouTube under 3D Maker Noob or 3D MN you probably fall under my category in both of those um, and Twitter Instagram at 3D Maker Noob as well and yeah I also have just Joe on YouTube, but that's that's a work in progress. Ooh, I, I blow that like I crash stuff on that. Oh, like, yeah, that's going to be like me doing stupid things, like re- eating stupid hot like chili balls. Why would chocolate. you do that? Because I was invited to when I went to the Swedish meetup, um, and the guys at 3D Prima told me like uh, on Fridays here we do like we eat chilies. They were lying to you, weren't they? And they did the, these, uh, the, no, they have this box of chili balls. It's chocolate balls. It's like a, a, chi, a chili Oh, chili roulette. chocolate. Chocolate yeah, chili. chili. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a roulette. You have a box with five different types of chocolate balls, milk chocolate, you know, and all that. And you have like uh, not, hey. not chili, all, <laughs> not hot at all to uh, Carolina Reaper. Hot. Okay. And... <laughs> and on my first try, I got the Carolina. Carolina. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was. About That's to a warm die. one, isn't it? <laughs> I was, yeah, I was dying. Like, literally why are people dying. eating hot stuff? I, I don't understand. And no, I, I I love spicy food. I okay, absolutely love spicy food. But yeah, yeah don't but cover yeah. it. But That's me. All right. So thanks everyone for listening, for watching, and yeah, thanks again for for you two for thanks taking for the time. Us. Thank you very much. And yeah, see you and hear you all in the next one. Bye. Bye. Bye.